Hi, this is Vanessa Gorman, and today we're going to cover the third declension of Greek nouns. Um, we've already covered the first and second declensions, and they were fairly straightforward. The third declension is a little tougher to deal with, but by now you should be pretty comfortable contracting vowels and, and seeing contracted vowels, which will help you. And also, I just want to always remind you, you're not being asked to reproduce forms. You're being asked to read and recognize. And there are a lot of third declension Greek nouns, and they're worth learning the most common ones because, again, you're saving yourself time and effort, and we're all about efficiency. Remember what you already learned. Every noun has gender, number, and case. Remember that neuter nouns have the same form in the nominative and the accusative. That's the same in the third declension as it is in the second. Neuter plural nouns acting as subjects take singular verbs. That's not going to change one bit. That's also the case. Remember, though, what I said earlier with the earlier noun chapter, articles match the nouns they modify in gender, number, and case. But that does not mean they have the same endings because the third declension endings are different. The articles follow the first and second declension patterns, and they never change, right? Feminine is feminine. The article, the feminine article never has a different declension. So you're going to have different endings. We've already seen this with masculine nouns in the first declensions, but you're going to see this everywhere with the third declension nouns because they have different endings. And of course, because they are a little bit oddball, they have to include the most common words in Greek. Words like man and woman and child and ship and father and mother and city and wall and town. So, you know, these are words that are very common. The ones that are common are very, very common. But fortunately, in all of the Hellenica, the number of third declension nouns used more than 20 times is a mere 27. That's not many. That's not bad. And in fact, before you start panicking over what, how you're going to memorize all these forms or how are you going to know them, I'm giving you a handout that gives you on one page the declension of all 27 of these nouns separately. So you can have this as a reference anytime you want it. Plus, you always have your morphological analyzer. So you don't have to worry about memorizing in the sense of reproducing. You should just try to recognize. And with that in mind, I want to go through how these are formed so that you can see the patterns. If you see the patterns, they're easier to remember, right? Um, I will mention that they're distributed pretty evenly by gender. So unlike the first two declensions that have some tendencies, um, nine are masculine, nine are feminine, seven are neuter. Two are masculine but can be feminine. So for example, the word child is usually masculine, but it can be feminine. Frankly, in the second declension, the word anthropos, the man, if you stick a feminine article on there, it becomes woman at, at times. But the article is definitely your friend here. The article should be that which you have absolutely memorized. It's the single most important thing to memorize in the Greek language. So these forms should be floating through your head when you sleep, and they will help you a great deal with third declension nouns. Why are third declension nouns funky? Well, they're funky because they're called consonant stems. Um, remember, the first declension is alpha stem. Second declension is omicron stem. Well, these have consonant stems. And consonants, when they, when they smash together, do different things. And so depending on what kind of consonant it ends with, it's going to have it follow a different pattern. And even though we call them consonant stems, some of them look to you and me like vowel stems. Um, and then you have vowels combining with vowels in funny ways. Um, the reason they look like vowels is mostly because um, archaic consonants that aren't used during classical Greek time left their traces on the language. So for example, they had a letter, a, a sound, um, called a digamma, which is a W sound, a W. Um, and so, for example, Ilios, um, the town Troy, 
was wilios, actually, and there's ways you can tell that there was actually a consonant there. Um, that's going to affect the way stems and and the um, inflection, inflective endings, the, the suffixes, go together. The other thing to know, and so, sorry, there's nine patterns of these plus some irregulars, so we're pretty spread over these patterns, so again, don't panic. You just have to kind of recognize them, and most of them are very, very easy to recognize. The crucial thing to know is the stem comes from the genitive. I talked about this earlier, and you probably said, why is she saying that? Because in the first and second declension, there's usually no difference between the nominative singular and the genitive singular stem. In the third declension, there's a lot of difference. So, for example, on air becomes andros, gune becomes gunaikos, nux becomes nuktos, pragma becomes pragmatos. So, there's no way you could have figured out that stem from the nominative. In fact, even though there looks like there might be patterns, they can be misleading. So, for example, some examples I got out of the new Cambridge Grammar of Classical Greek, agon looks a lot like garon, agon contest garon old man, except the genitive of agon is agonos, and so your stem is agon, whereas the genitive of, of old man is geront, so your stem is geront. We get gerontology from that, right? We get agony from contest, by the way. Likewise, elpis, hope, and polis, city-state, look like they're the same pattern, but in fact you get into the genitive, and elpidos, you've got the delta in the stem, whereas in polis you wind up with what seems like a vowel stem, and so completely different declensions, even though you're adding the same endings. Pater is another odd one. Um, pater and soter, as in savior, right, soter. Um, father and soter look alike, yet in the genitive we have patros and we have soteros. And in fact, patros has some other oddities as well that we'll look at. So look at the genitive to find the stem. Don't look at the nominative. If you look them up in the lexicon, it will always give you the genitive as well because it's different. The basic endings. Okay, the nominative may be nothing at all or a sigma. Um, the genitive, however, is o, o, Omicron sigma. Dative is a long yoda. Accusative is either a short alpha or a nu. That sounds funky. Why could that be? Who knows? Um, a linguist can explain it to you, but I think it's just simpler to just look at it at this point. Nominative plural es right? Epsilon Sigma, genitive plural, our old friend Omega Nu. Dative plural is Sigma Yoda, sometimes with a movable Nu. And that's going to be throwing things off because when you add a Sigma to other things, crazy things happen. That's why we have the, the nominative that's odd. What you'll often see is that the nominative singular and dative plural seem like they're working off a, a different stem from the rest. And then in the accusative plural alpha sigma. Now notice masculine and feminine is the same, so at least you don't have to memorize separate se feminine forms. Neuter, the nominative singular is whatever it happens to be, and then that the accusative will match that. It's not necessarily going to, it's not going to end with a, a Omicron nu like in the second declension. It's just whatever. Sometimes it will have Omicron nu, sometimes it won't. In the plural, you get your old familiar alphas in the nominative and accusative, but sometimes they lengthen into etas. Okay, so that's the one time when neuter plurals might not have alphas ending them in the nominative and accusative. So these are your basic endings. These are the endings you should memorize. Okay, but let's see how they are applied to words from our list of 27. Many of them look very regular once you know the genitive. So, for example, Ho archon, which translates as an archon, a ruler, right? Um, we get the word archo to rule. Um, the archon was the chief magistrate in Athens, and there were um, nine of them, later ten of them a year. Ho archon to archontos. So you see that the omicron of the nominative disappears, and we have just the short omicron. So there's your stem, archont. And then you add your endings, O-S-I, 
excuse me, Omicron Sigma, Yoda, Alpha, Epsilon Sigma, Omicron Nu, skip the dative, Alpha Sigma. The dative, if you have a new tau sigma in a row, you can't pronounce it. So the new tau drops out completely, and we get what's called compensatory lengthening. The Omicron lengthens into an U to tell us that something has dropped out there. And this happens a lot when you combine sigmas to, especially uh, to, to does and tis. So if you know your endings and you know that genitive singular, these are all going to look fine to you. Okay? Stems ending with a nasal or also liquid um, L or R sounds, but we don't have any of them on our list. We just have some ending with the nasal, um, the new. So Limane is a harbor, if so, a harbor. Um, Chaimon is winter, and Mace is the ubiquitous word month, although you almost never see it in the nominative singular. You're constantly seeing it in some of the oblique cases, right, in the month of, so we get many a lot. So again, once you get to genitive, you see the stem. And so the stem of Limane is Limen. The stem of Chaimon is Chaimon, with a, with a long O. The stem of Mice is Main. Um, and then you add your endings. And when the sigma gets added on, the new drops out. Okay? What about words ending with dentals? T, D, or th. So tau, delta, or th. So I'm giving you four examples off our list. Um, nux, which means night. We get uh, nocturnal from this, right? And the stem nukt, you can understand how if you add a sigma in the nominative singular, you get nux. So that one actually makes sense. Then you go and add on the endings. And then the problem again is the dative plural. So it can be nuxi, and sometimes they actually added the extra syllable nuktesi. Um, neither one's going to give you any trouble. Um, it's such a recognizable word. Patris is the feminine that means fatherland. Pater means father is masculine. Patris is fatherland. And so the stem is patrid because D and S together turned into just an S. And you go through and you make the endings just, you add the endings just as normal. And of course, in the dative plural, the D drops out and you just have the sigma. Fugas, a fugitive, fugitive. Um, we've had fugue, right? Uh, we've had fugo. So um, again, there's a delta in the stem and you just add the regular endings and the only place it's wonky is in the dative plural where the sigma connects with the delta and the delta drops out. Um, Pice is a little bit different. Pice, pidos, this is the word child. It's usually masculine, but they can make it feminine if they want to refer to a daughter. And the stem is pied, right? We get pediatrician from this. Um, os, I, a, es, on, esi, as. Notice here's a case where the stem doesn't lose the D. Instead, they just add it on. Um, so it gives you no problem at all because the stem hasn't changed. So these aren't too problematic, right? You get used to the fact that the dative plural is a little abbreviated, and these are all following the regular pattern. Likewise, um, feminine palatals or velars, like the word phalanx. Remember, if you put two Gs together, it sounds like ng. So phalanx become, becomes phalankos. The stem has got the double G in it, and if you go on down, you just add the endings to the double G, and of course, in the dative singular, it changes, and it changes the same way the nominative singular changes, so not going to give you problems. You get into the dentals, you get a few interesting things happening. Um, neuter stems ending with dentals. This is actually kind of a weird pattern because they add some sounds. So stra strateoma becomes strateomatos, and mat becomes part of the stem. And the fact is there's a lot of these, but they're, you see that ma ending, and you know, oh, it's a neuter. So the singular is going to be ma, and the plural is going to be mata. 
And there's enough of these that you become very comfortable with them very fast. Um, even though it looks a little odd that pragma becomes pragmatos, um, we get pragmatic from this. That's, that's a um, deed or a problem or a thing, pragma. Strateoma is an army or also a, it can mean a campaign, but usually it's the army itself. Krema is the word money. So clearly that's going to come up quite often. So again, these shouldn't look odd to you. Likewise, masculine stems ending in ro. We have on air that becomes andros. So we get the word android, right? Um, and that follows everything. The dative plural is a little funky. That's the only problem. Pater adds a little twist to this. Now, pater, as you might expect, is an incredibly old word that goes back to uh, Proto-Indo-European, as does below mater and thugater, mother and daughter. And what's weird with this is you, you get this intermittent epsilon in the stem. So pater becomes patros, patri, but then we have patera, pateres, pateron. We lose it again for patrasi and then pateras. And mother and daughter do the same kind of thing. And sometimes you see alternate forms where you lose that epsilon. Sometimes you have this pattern. But is it going to bother you? I, I've never had any problems with the word. I don't find this problematic at all. So, so far, these are actually not bad, right? They're, if you know the endings, if you find the stem, you can recognize these very easily. Then it becomes a bit trickier. And it becomes trickier because the stem becomes vowels. The stem be starts ending with a vowel, either because an archaic consonant dropped out or something like that. So, so for example, we have stems that end in epsilon sigma, omicron sigma, or alpha sigma. Um, but the sigma drops out because it's between vowels. And so it doesn't look like it's there. Okay? Um, I should, sorry, this shouldn't say stems. There, it's lemmas ending in these forms. Uh, the problem is there's this sigma that drops out and it causes all kinds of strange things to happen. Essentially, what we're doing is contracting vowels, lengthening and contracting vowels. So the word taihos wall is one of these. Taihos in the nominative becomes taihus in the genitive. And then you have your stem and you add your endings. And so it's not so bad, except that you've got to lengthen out some of the endings. It's a neuter. So even though it looks like a masculine because it's got the os ending, it's actually a neuter. And so the plural is going to be taihe, not with an alpha, but with an eta. The word trireme, ship, since we're doing a lot of naval campaigns, we're going to have a lot of ships. It's very recognizable from the stem. It comes from the words tri, three, and ors. Um, trie race in the nominative becomes trie rus. So we get this us ending in the genitive when we do this quite a lot. And then you continue on with lengthening out the vowels so that the alpha in the accusative singular becomes an eta. The yoda in the dative singular becomes an epsilon yoda. The epsilon sigma in the nominative plural becomes an epsilon yoda sigma. So you see, this is this is becomes predictable, even though it's a lit, looks a little odd. We're just lengthening out the vowels. Telos, the same thing. This is another neuter, and it means the end. So we get teleology is is the study of things that are aimed at one end. Um, the end or, or a goal, for example, um, follows the same pattern as taikos. Etos, the word for year, also a neuter. Notice we're seeing a little bit of a pattern, right? It's got a slightly different stem, so instead of us in the genitive singular, you get etos in the genitive singular. But otherwise, it looks like these others. So there's kind of a pattern here that these four words follow one feminine and three neuters. So you've got to just kind of go with the flow and know that they're going to have odd forms because they're very, very common words. Likewise, we have these stems that end in uh, yoda or a upsilon. Um, 
the genitive singular usually has an epsilon omega sigma on the end. And so we've got four of these in our list, especially this word polis, which is one of the most common words in the Greek language. Um, polis, poleos, pole, polin, polais, poleon, polesi, polais. Notice here that the nominative and accusative plurals are the same form. Um, so you just have to tell them apart by either context or your friendly article. Um, presbus is the same. It actually means old man, um, and it's used often to mean an envoy or a messenger, an ambassador. Um, do not miss in the bottom right is the word power, and we get the word dynamite from that, and that's a feminine, but it follows the same pattern. Um, the only question is whether it has a yoda in the stem in the in the accusative singular and nominative singular or an upsilon. And then we also get this neuter astu, which means town. Um, and so it is obviously an upsilon stem. It's a neuter, so that astu is the nominative singular, so therefore it's the accusative singular. Aste, aste. And the rest follows the same pattern we've been seeing. So that's another paradigm. Then we have the stems ending in diphthongs. And they're, of course, going to do odd things as well because they have to contract. They also tend to have epsilon, omicron, sigma in the genitive singular. So nous meaning ship, it's got so little stem, I didn't bother putting anything in red. The stem is essentially the, the letter nu. Um, do not confuse this with the other word to not own, which means a, a temple or an altar. Uh, yeah, temple, temple, Phobos is altar. Um, so we get nautical from this clearly, but you see that the, the whole word changes because the ow of the stem contracts in various ways. Again, your morphological analyzer can be your best friend sometimes. In the bottom right, Zeus, right, God, Deus, is the same kind of thing. You've got uh, uh, Yoda in the stem as well, and so you get funny things happening. You see a diaresis there in the in the um, dative, that the two dots there that tell you not to combine the two I sounds into one diphthong. They're, they're separate, pronounced separately. D, 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 E, D, E. Um, notice there's no plural because it's Zeus, so um, you can't have plural Zeus's. It's different words for um, if you need gods. Um, Basileus, the king, is a masculine, and of course this is a very common, common word. Um, lengthens out the vowels, but at least you have lots of stem to work off of. And hippeus, we had hippos, horse. Hippeus, anything ending with eos is typically an occupation. And you'll see others of these, but this is the only common one on our list. So hippeos meaning a cavalryman. Um, and again, it keeps the nice stem, but then it lengthens out its vowels. So this is another set of patterns. And then we have just irregulars. And in this case, gune is the one irregular that I want to mention because it gets a completely funky stem. They, the two words aren't. You know, clearly something has happened in the nominative um, because the, the word is gunaik. But other than that, it follows the pattern just like anything else. It means woman. It also can mean wife. I want to also mention, because I always find them confusing, names ending with eta sigma, like Pericles or Socrates. Many of them are third declension, and so they will follow this third declension pattern. But you've got to be careful because some of them are first declension. So Euripides looks like it ought to be the same declension, but in fact it's a um, treated like hoplites or one of these first declension masculines. So be careful of those. So that seems like a lot. I know it's it's the third declension can be confusing, right? It sounds like you could feel overwhelmed, but think of it in these terms. I've given you all of this on one sheet of paper, okay? I've sorted out all 27 of the words, plus I've given you um, the names in the bottom right corner. 
Um, you shouldn't have any problem with this. You should be able to deal with this. The only, by the way, the, one of the words is Acropolis. So um, I figure if you've got polis, you've got Acropolis, right? So I've separated them by color coding into the sort of the different categories. So there's one labial in red in the top, the phalanx, and then there's a couple with row endings in red on the right top. And so just so you can see the basic categories, but you can keep this next to you to, to help you, to help remember the patterns until you have it down. Um, it's not so much. It's not so bad. I'm not asking you to memorize all these patterns and then to reproduce them and get all the accents right and all that. That's, that's silly. Um, but these are words you will see fairly often. I've given you um, the count. So you see the word down at the bottom left, ship occurs 201 times, um, horseman 167 times, um, the word man in the top, in the third column, 169 times. The word wall in blue on the on the left column here, 115 times. So some of these are quite common. Some of these not so much. The word month doesn't happen as often. Um, telos, meaning result or end. It can also mean office, by the way. Um, not so much. If you want to go by frequency, then Learn the words by frequency. Polis is by far and away the most common with 489. Um, this is why I like to give you the count so you can decide is this worth learning, is this not worth learning. So, of course, you've got practice sentences where you have lots and lots of sentences to get used to using these words, especially the most common of these words.